Welcome again to today's devotion. Uh, we have been going through Psalm, and today we're going to turn to Psalm 62. Uh, Psalm 62, hopefully you have your Bible and your journal. Uh, by now, if you've been traveling along with these devotions, you have probably uh, seen uh, quite a theme, a pattern of David and his prayers. And today is no exception in Psalm 62. And you probably have noticed in times of trouble, in times of peace, in times of uh, just a, a normal course of David's life, whether uh, his life be in turmoil or in a, a, a valley of peace, we see that David is constantly asking of God. He's, out, he's constantly uh, asking of God in a way that is pleading and totally dependent upon God for the answer. And this is one of the key spiritual uh, buildups and blessings in our life as we study Psalms to understand the needful condition of the believer to be in prayer before the Lord. As we come to Psalm 62, in this familiar pattern, we see that David begins to address God with the knowledge of his character and confessing agreement to the Lord's salvation and strength. So David comes into prayer and he says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not greatly be shaken. For God alone is David's opening in this prayer. When he uh, writes this song, the, these words, his confession is that it is God alone. And in God's character, David understands that God is salvation, uh, redemption, um, deliverance, and not just in our soul, but in our very existence of life day to day. And so from him, from God, comes salvation. And so David confesses in God alone. He's not going to look to other things. He's going to look to God alone. He also, uh, in understanding who God is, confesses, that is, agrees, that God alone is going to be his rock. We discussed that in yesterday's devotion in Psalm 61, that God will be the rock in his salvation. And because of this, he says, I shall not be greatly shaken. Uh, it doesn't say I will not be shaken. It says I will not be greatly shaken. There are times in our life that we are going to be uh, shaken in our uh, structure of belief, our trust. Uh, we are going to fight the, the emotional fear versus uh, the truth of what we have read in Scripture. There are times where we are going to be grown up by suffering, and so there will be times of being shaken, but never in the Lord will we be greatly shaken. What that means is we will never be taken apart. The Lord holds us. He sustains us. The discipline that we need is this uh, pattern of David in his prayer. So as he comes to the Lord and he makes this confession, we see again the familiar pattern that he states his troubles, and then we see the Selah, the pause. Coming to the Lord with what's going on around us. I find these words starting in verse 3 uh, very appropriate to our culture and our day. Let me read them uh, through verse 4, 3 and 4, and then just uh, show the how in our pattern of prayer taken from the psalmist, we can uh, come to great strength in the Lord as our salvation and as our rock, our refuge. He says, How long will all of you, that's all people, how long will all of you attack a man to batter him? They, now he's talking about people who uh, are battering a person. We'll come back to that in a moment. But he switches from how, how, how long will all of you to they. There's a certain type of people who live outside uh, of God's truth, outside of God's word, outside of God's promise. And so he says, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. He pauses. 
So he, he, he confesses to God, God in his character, that God will be his salvation, his rock, his refuge. And then he tells God his hurt in what he sees. How often since uh, the year 2020 began have we come to the Lord confessing that he is our God, he is our rock, he is our salvation, and being honest before God to give him what is troubling us. More importantly, regardless of whatever political influences that we have, whatever cultural, ethnic uh, influences that we have, how often are we willing as the psalmist to come daily before God to state to God what is going on? Obviously, it's not that God doesn't know. It's that David is seeing what is taking place And David is longing for God to answer. And so in this case, in verse 3, he says, How long will all of you, because inherent in mankind is the sinful nature, how how long will all of you attack a man to batter him? That word uh, that that is translated batter uh, is, is basically breaking in upon someone and assailing them. Um, uh, we've seen videos in the last couple of weeks of, uh, for example, a man just walking by an elderly lady and for no reason other than sin, evil, he walks by and strikes her in the face. She falls, I think 92 years old, elderly lady and falls. And as she falls, she hits a fire hydrant, uh, to the goodness of God, she is doing well physically but she has a great fear now in her heart that she can't even walk down the street. We've seen uh, people attacking people. We've seen the violence of burning down city structures. Uh, We've seen coarse, harsh, uh, awful language of youth, middle-aged and old alike, all in this civil unrest that we're going through. We've seen a horrible video of a man crying for mercy and the police officer unmercifully takes his life. We've seen all this on TV. You can't escape it. It's before us. And so how long, Lord, how long are people going to act this way to bring people down? Not everything that's being said about this time in our nation is for the good for it to be resolved, uh, to be healed. Uh, There are people who are in an industry to continually stir up this hostility with no plans to reconcile, with no plans to help resolve the problems because it's a money maker to keep people divided politically and for other reasons. Not everybody that speaks has our best interest at heart. And so David in his own time knew this and he said, how long are are people going to continue to attack a person to assail them, to batter them? It's like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. If you can get a picture of, I was working out in my yard a couple of weeks ago when there was a fence post that was falling down. And so I took my uh, sledgehammer and just, uh, it was already falling down, but I couldn't get it all the way out of the ground. So as it was already falling down, I took a sledgehammer just to beat it further down so that I could remove it. That's the image. That's the picture of what David is saying. Uh, they they uh, come upon a person to assail them, to batter them, and the person already is like a leaning wall. It, it's, it's not going to make it. It's tottering. It's weak. It's feeble. And they just kick it all the way down. That's what David is seeing in his culture. That's what we are seeing uh, on our TV at night uh, reported by the news. They only, now he, he goes from all of you to they, those who are unrepentant, those who are willing to turn, they only plan to, tr- to thrust him down from his high position. Uh, be careful when people elevate one group over another group. Be careful. God is a God of uh, showing no favoritism, and nor can God's people. We need to be careful how we speak. We need to understand that words have meaning. And so we are never to put one person up in order for another person to be brought down. That is sinful action. That is ungodly, not of God. And so in all of our resolutions, in all of our 
proposals and all of our thinking, individually, corporately, government-wise, we need to look at all people to make sure that we are not showing favoritism that one person or one group is elevated at the dismissal of a, another person. Christians cannot be part of that behavior uh, and, and remain in the blessings and the, and the uh, character of God. And so he, he says they, they only plan to thrust them down. There are some proposals that only plan to thrust people down. They're wrong, and we should not support them. They take pleasure in falsehood. Uh, falsehood is, uh, is a lie, is deceit. But in today's culture, as it was in David's, is that people say things that sound good, even sound wonderfully pleasing, but at the root lies a lie. That is falsehood, and we cannot support that. We can't just take someone's opinion and consider it to be good. We can't just take the first reaction and say that's the answer. We need to investigate. We need to research because if it's taking uh, one group down and lifting another group, it's wrong. If it is uh, not for all people, it's wrong. If it's based in a lie, based in deceit, uh, based in manipulation, it's wrong. We cannot support it. We should not support it. We should reject it. And then David says, they bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. They're like tombs, whitewashed. They look good on the outside, but in the inside is death and decay uh, of the, the body deteriorating. The same with people who say wonderful things about people, but in the background, they're, they're mean-spirited, they're evil, they say things from their heart. And remember, uh, from our heart comes out our actions. And David puts in an important pause here. He says, Selah, that means to pause, meditate. David has stated that God is his rock, his refuge, uh, his salvation. David has stated what's going on that he has seen. And then he says, pause, meditate. Uh, we are seeing what's going on in our culture today. Pause and meditate. Why? Because we don't want to speak from our heart. We want to speak God's truth. Let me say that again. We don't want to react and speak of what we think best. We want to be uh, given the words of God to speak in this lost and broken culture so that God's glory can be shown. Uh, I have been known uh, by people in my life uh, to have a quick temper. I've been known to say a quick word. The Bible teaches me to listen before I speak. Uh, the old cliche, I have two ears and one mouth, I should listen more than I speak. Um, in the Word of God, I have found I should seek God first for His answer and only speak that, not my reaction. So, Selah, pause when you tell God what's going on. Why? So that he might give you uh, the, the words, the reasoning, the, the call, the move to make next. David says, uh, after he pauses, after he meditates, he says again in verse 5, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. Here, here's what he does after he states his trouble and he pauses. The psalmist now, in speaking to God, the psalmist speaks to his soul. Why? Because we want to react. We want to take revenge. We, we want to say the first thing that comes into our mind, our heart. And so David is telling his soul, quiet down. I know who God is. He's my rock. He's my refuge. He's my salvation. He's my God. Here's what's going on around me. So person, soul, silence, wait on God. God alone, wait, wait soul in silence. For my hope is from him. It, 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 it's a word that means uh, descending down upon. God's hope, the, expect, the expectancy 
of God falls fresh from him, God, to us. We don't tell God what to expect. Our hope is that God moves us in his glory, in his word, and in his way. This is why the Bible tells us not to seek vengeance, for vengeance is of the Lord. We want to wait on him. So we have to tell ourselves, wait. Then he says, he only, he, he goes back to the confirmation of who God is. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. He's now said this twice, once to God and reminder to his soul. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. All those phrases, verses 1 and 2, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, these are things you should be writing in your journal. You should be making them personal and praying them out to the Lord and speaking them to yourself to wait on the Lord. A after he says, God is my mighty rock, my refuge, he says in verse 8, trust in him at all times, O people. So he, he, he starts off by addressing God with the character of God, confessing the Lord's salvation and strength. He moves into stating his troubles, his trials, his perplexities to God. And then he speaks to God while speaking to his own soul. And now the psalmist in his prayer teaches not only himself, but all people. He says again in verse 8, trust in him at all time, O peoples. Who is he? He's talking to his nation. Trust in the Lord at all times. I say to the church today, not because I'm an authority, but because Jesus Christ is the authority, we are to trust in the Lord at all times. Yes, this time. And tomorrow when the new trouble begins, at that time. We cannot react. We cannot shoot off our mouths. We cannot position ourselves as we have the answer. The answer comes in the Lord. And until he gives us that answer in his blessing, in his timing, in his power, we wait on him. But people are hurting right now. Yes, God knows this, and God loves the world. God has so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you and I think that we can truly love these people more than God? Let us wait on God who loves. That he give us the instruction to move out. We already have our basic instructions to, to be the salt and the light. We, we have the basic instruction to glorify God and enjoy his presence forever. That's what we do as we wait. But instead of going out and shooting off my mouth uh, of some kind of solution or reconciliation, I want to wait on the Lord. I want his activity, not my activity, because God's activity is eternal. It's permanent. Man's activity, mine, is temporal. And it can lead to more bad, or it can lead to temporary good. God is eternal. God is good. God is love. God is strength. God is power. God is refuge. God is my salvation. That's what I want to speak at a time such as this. So he says, trust in him. Trust in God at all times, O people. Here's the key. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge to us. You know what he says? Selah. Meditate on that. Stop. Don't go one moment further in your prayer when you confess this to the Lord, that I will trust in you at all times, O Lord. I am pouring out my heart before you. Pause. What good is it to tell someone something if the other person doesn't have time to speak back? So what good is it to tell God our troubles if we're not going to listen to him about our troubles? Prayer is not one-way communication, it's two-way. I recognize God's character, I wait on Him, and as I wait, He will speak. It's a two-way communication. I'm praying the Word of God, the Word of God is bathed in prayer, and God speaks. And if we move without God speaking, we are moving to disaster, not to blessing. So he says, Pour out your heart before God. Now, the next thing, after he teaches this to all people, more importantly, teaching it to himself, he closes his prayer in affirming God's truth. This is important. This is always, uh, uh, so, so we've told uh, God is character, what we will do. We confess agreement with it. We tell him our trials, our troubles, our struggles. We, we affirm to our soul, we're going to wait in the Lord. We're going to allow him to speak. 
Now, what does all this mean? We need to affirm who God is in our prayers. And look what he says. Uh, first, in verse 9, he, he talks about the brevity of life on earth, both rich and poor. We're given, the Bible tells us to count our days, number our days. We are given an exact amount of time. We don't know how much time that is. God does. But if you look at the span of time, we are but a breath of life. Are we going to make the most in the Lord of our time? Or are we going to make the most of us in our time? It's brief. How can God use us to make impact for his glory, not our glory? And so with that, David reminds himself and he reminds the reader of Psalms, put no trust in extortion. It's interesting, in the Hebrew language, that word can mean oppression. Put no trust in oppression. You say, well, who in the world would do that? Um, wise people won't. But wise people, or people who are not wise, often don't see that the solutions that mankind comes up with sometimes is a worse oppression than the first oppression. The, this idea, on I, I don't want to be political, and I don't believe this is political, this idea of defund the police is oppression. Run from that idea and find God's wisdom. Uh, you can't read the Bible without understanding uh, obedience to law and order. You, you cannot understand God's word if you want to get rid of the first line of defense that God himself has established in government to uh, be over uh, the people in communities. This, uh, this idea of uh, put no trust in oppression, um, extortion. You know, these people who have moved into public property that, that is owned by the people and called it their own place now, that's, that's oppression. And it's also extortion. They're not going to let it go until somebody meets their demands. That's extortion. That's not the way Christian behavior uh, is based or about. And so put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. That word robbery is, is things that are taken away by violence. Put no trust in that. Put no trust in oppression. Put no trust uh, in, in vain hopes uh, of people losing things by force being taken away from taken away from them. And then he says, if riches increase, set not your heart on them. If prosperity in your life increases, don't trust the prosperity. Uh, riches here can be force, resources, as in money, as in words, thoughts, education. Uh, prosperity, wealth comes in many different forms. Put no trust in it. So, in his affirming these truths, he speaks again of God in his prayer. And what a powerful way to close. David says this of his personal witness as the psalmist. He says, once God has spoken. <laughs> I love that. Once God has spoken. Uh, we have many reminders in Scripture of what God once has said, but God spoke once. And he says, twice has he heard it. Uh, how many times have we heard the once spoken God? He says, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Power does not belong to me. Power does not belong to you, nor does it belong to our government, the world. Power belongs to God. And he says, and that to you, O Lord, he, he's speaking to God. Power belongs to you, God, and that you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. That is mercy. That's enduring, lasting love belongs to God. That means without God, mankind will not find steadfast love. Without God, men will not have power. Oh, they might exert something over other people, but power belongs to God. God's power is that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. power of God is that justice is in the Lord. And somebody might run on for a long time, being violent or oppressive, but God is the judge and God himself will take that person down who is unrepentant. We need to understand this about God. God is just. And therein his power is displayed, both now and at the end, 
at the great white throne judgment. Power belongs to God. And then he says, for you, verse 10, or excuse me, verse 12 at the end, for you will render to a man according to his work. The word render here is make safe. It means to complete a man. It means to reward a man. So you, God, will render a person, mankind, male, female, according to his work. Now, uh, someone who's new to the Bible might think, oh, well, that's good. If I give money to the church, if I help the poor people, um, if I do this, if I do that, then God's going to uh, reward me as he rewards those with eternal life. And the answer is wrong. That's not what God is speaking here. What kind of works do we do? Jesus, in his earthly ministry, was asked, what must I do to earn eternal life? Jesus, knowing man's heart, said, okay, you, you want to do something? You want to earn something? Uh, please understand, you can't earn God's love. God, God was blessed to bestow his love toward us. But you, Jesus said, you, you, you want to work? You, you want to do a lifelong project here? Here's what it is. The words will shock you. It's found in John 6 and, and verse 29. He says, the work of the Lord is this, to believe in the one God sent. Well, that's faith. That's not a work. No, faith is work. Faith is a hard work, harder work than you'll ever do in anything else. Because in faith, we trust God and move in his word. When the human heart wants to do it our way, we say, no, I trust God. When the human uh, heart wants to pop off an answer to a solution, we say, no, I will wait on the Lord. Why would I wait on the Lord? Because I trust God. It's a hard work. Jesus said, you, you, you want to do a work? Trust in the one whom God sent. What was Jesus saying? In all of our life, in all of our matters, in all of our troubles, in all of our blessings, in all of our weaknesses, in all of the things that we will deal with in life, Jesus is the answer because God anointed him and sent him. That's the work of God. Believe in the one he sent. His name is Jesus. Let me just give you uh, five quick examples, and then we'll begin to sign off for the day. Jesus is the expression of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You want to do a work? Believe in the one God sent. Who did God send? His Son. Why? Because God so loved you, he gave his only begotten Son. There's the first measure of faith, the work that we are to do. Then he also says, or we also see in Scripture, that Jesus is our example. And Jesus said, follow me. That's a faith. That's a trust. But we'll never trust him. We'll never have faith. We'll never have the work of believing in the one God sent until we first deny ourselves and pick up our cross. That is, pick up our sufferings and follow Jesus. It's suffering to follow Jesus. Uh, I, just think of your greatest temptation, the one that you fall to all the time. To follow Jesus means you have to give up that fleshly gratification. That's suffering. Um, think of what's going on in our nation. We just want to storm out there and make an answer, make a decision, help. But trusting God, yeah, takes time. Um, so faith is the work. You, 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 want to, you want to work? This is God's work. Believe, trust, have faith in the one God sent. For he is the expression of God's love. He is our example. He is our sacrifice. He, he obeyed the Father even to the point of death, death on the cross. Jesus, uh, in God's expression of love, loved us, uh, demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet condemned to death because of sin, Christ Jesus died for us. That's a work of faith. Then he says, uh, or the scriptures show us that Jesus is our new life. Not only through his blood did he forgive us, but through his resurrection, he has given us a new life in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that, that raised Jesus from the dead is the Holy Spirit that has been sent upon those who will confess in faith the name of Jesus Christ. And so we no longer live for our fleshly desires. We walk in the Spirit of God. That's a work of faith. And then Jesus is our power. He's equipped us through his Holy Spirit. He's equipped us. He's empowered us to do the things he told us to follow, which is him. He carries our burden. He carries our weight. That's a 
work of faith. Um, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, through love serve one another. That's a work of faith because we can't love and serve one another until we first love and serve God who sent his son Jesus Christ. And by faith we express our trust in God in Christ Jesus. And then my heart is given a new life and so my love then is expressed outwardly to my neighbor, to my, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, and yes, even to my enemies, those who would be against the very things I say. Only God can give mankind that kind of love. And so through love, serve one another. How? By walking in the Spirit. What does that mean? Allowing the Holy Spirit to equip you, to guide you, to teach you, to remind you, so that your life is a testimony of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the fruit, that's the work that comes from faith in Jesus Christ that's expressed outwardly to those around us. Where does all this begin? In our confession to who God is. He is our God, He is our rock, He is our salvation. What does that mean? I will wait, O oh my soul, on the Lord. Where does all that begin? Hearing the word, believing what God has said, what God has done, and what God has shown you. Faith, work, believe in the one he sent. I hope you take time today to uh, read all of Psalm 62, all the words, and put that pattern in your journal so that in your prayers, uh, your pattern is the psalmist, uh, which is the pattern that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer. It all comes together as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. May God bless you today, and we will see you tomorrow in another psalm that we will study.